We are now ready to move on to the next section of our discourse this morning. We are moving into uh, a panel discussion by the UN agencies. What does the UN think about urban spaces, public spaces within the UN system? What is happening? How is the UN engaging? It's my pleasure to invite to take their seats, please, as I call out, as I introduce, rather, my colleagues from four agencies, beginning first with Dr. Cindy Smith of UNICRI. UNICRI is United Nations, I hope I get that right, Institute for Crime Research. Um, she's recently been appointed as director of UNICRI. Dr. Cindy brings a wealth of experience in the field of criminology and justice, policy making, strategic planning, and education. She previously was the senior coordinator for international program in the Office for Monitor and uh, Combat Trafficking in Persons at the United States Department of State. Dr. Cindy, you are welcome to this panel. Yes. Next, with pleasure, I'd like to invite my colleague, Thomas Melin of UN Habitat. He's an architect and planner by training. Mr. Thomas, who addressed us yesterday, and is not new to you, he's been working in the field of international urban development for more than 25 years. And currently, he heads the Office of the External Relations at UN Habitat. Previously, he was with the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency where he served as head of the Urban Development Division. My pleasure to welcome you, Thomas. <laughs> My pleasure to welcome to the podium, to, 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 to the stage, Dr. Carlos Dora of World Health Organization. Dr. Dora is a medical doctor and epidemiologist. Epidemiologist, did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> he, he is, he is, a, he's a, he is a coordinator of the Interventions for Health Environment Unit in WHO. He, and he is also, uh, in this capacity, he has spearheaded efforts to bring together the various types of health impact assessment and to the global level, including health impact assessment in cities. Doctor, you are most welcome. It's a pleasure to meet you again. Finally, least but last but not the least, is uh, Dr. Stephanos Fatiu of the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, our neighbors in, in, in Nairobi. Dr. Stephanos is an expert on sustainable development and currently heads the Cities and Lifestyles Unit at, of UNEP based in Geneva. He brings a wealth of experience on sustainable cities, green buildings, responsible consumption, and sustainable lifestyle to the panel. So you are most welcome again, Stephanus. So that's our panel for the UN agencies. They are going to, in the next few minutes, uh, respond to some just questions that will give us, uh, I believe, deeper understanding into what the UN thinks or does with uh, open spaces and how the rest of us can relate with you. Because you guys have a lot of information and you talk a lot of stuff. <laughs> but I, I, need, I need us to break it down to simple, simple issues today that we can understand because we are the women and the children and the vulnerables out there in the park and in the streets. How can the UN help us? So kindly, please, my first question to you, and you can all take turns, two minutes each, if you can kindly respond to what does public space mean to you, each of your agencies? in achieving your organizational mandate? And how, no, that is three questions actually, but it's all in the one group. Yeah? So what does public space mean to you in each of your mandates? And please keep your mandate simple and clear. And how have you been involved with public space in your work? How do you engage with it? And then um, and in your organization broadly, uh, uh, how is it unique, uniquely placed? to do uh, public space work, to make public space meaningful. So that's about three in one, but I'm sure you get my gist. So two minutes each, please. 
Thank you. Yes, beginning with you, sir. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to the colleagues of UN Habitat and the organizers of the Future of Places that they have invited UNEP in this panel. We feel very privileged. Um, I would say that uh, for UNEP, the mandate of UNEP, our motto is environment for development. So we are an organization that we do provide uh, policy support and uh, we are aspire that we are setting up the global environmental agenda, but our objective is always development, development for people and sustainable development for human beings. So within, within this mandate that we have to provide uh, policy support for achieving environment for development, we see the public space and our work on this in, in three different dimensions. One is that the public space in the cities is the one that integrates the, uh, and starts to create links between the built environment and societies. Because we are not looking at the public space as something that is static, but we are looking at something that provides both the physical, but also the institutional framework for uh, people and societies to interact. The second is that public space, and I think here is where uh, we look at the public space from a unique unit perspective, public space contributes to a better flow of resources. We are approaching the cities under the prism of what we call urban metabolism. We do believe that cities are living organizations, that they are metabolized different resources from water, air, uh, minerals, uh, but also human resources, capacities, knowledge, and the contribution of individuals. And it is the public space that it will provide a much better framework for, th for these resources to flow more efficiently. And what we need and what we try to support the cities to do is to improve the efficiency with which the resources are metabolized within the city. And in, in this case, we believe that the public space provides services that they will make this flow of resources much more efficient. One very simple example uh, is that if, if we focus on resource efficiency, we achieve to produce more with less inputs. And less inputs usually means a need for less productive space. So if you need less productive space, less, sta less space that could be attributed to, to private uh, production activities, you have more, uh, uh, more private, uh, excuse me, more public space. To wrap up, I would say that the UNIP is, un UNIP's unique advantage is the approach of the urban metabolism and the thing that we are working both on the interaction of the built environment and the citizens, and this is why we have this new unit on cities and lifestyles, and also the fact that we do believe that the flow of resources is the one that characterizes the development partners of the cities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefanos. Uh, two things I heard you say, <coughs> urban metabolism. That's a term I have not really used before, but that's very interesting. And that public spaces facilitate the flow of resources. Now that's interesting. That's interesting, but I'm sure the thought would get more developed as we move on. Please, to Dr. Dora. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, WHO is very pleased to be here. Um, it's a very important, the urban, the cities are very important. There's a number of determinants of health mm -hmm. uh, which really cause or avoid or prevent disease and can promote public health. So for us, the uh, ability to uh, identify the opportunities for public health in public policies in cities is, is quite crucial. So it's central to this work. And our understanding of what are the terminals of health, what causes disease, and how we can get uh, a better deal for people, uh, including for people who are disadvantaged or who are living in slums or in poor areas. So the, the way we uh, operate in trying to identify those opportunities is quite specific. It's in the mandate of WHO. It's all around evidence and the scientific evidence for what works and what doesn't. Uh, we think that we make a contribution by identifying, by separating, by identifying where, where there's uh, evidence and where there's need for, for, for the evidence. Uh, we also have a strong, so we do, 
when we have a lot of evidence, we do our guidelines. And you have all heard probably our air quality guidelines or water quality guidelines or noise guidelines. And we are, at the moment, we're doing housing and health guidelines, which include access to public transport, how the building is made, what's the ventilation in the building. It's a, it's a, a large package uh, of um, determinants of health linked to housing and to where the house is and how accessible it is. Um, and how does that protect public health? So the idea is that when, once we have those guidance, we can set targets, we can have a lead equivalent, not what's a healthy house, uh, not only what's an environmental a friendly house, but what's a healthy house. And we think that can influence, and that does influence, the markets, the way people see things, the way the policies are developed. And we have good experience in water, in air quality, in other areas. So we have great trust that um, uh, this will happen. In addition to the guidance, we have a lot of monitoring evaluation. And that's very important to, to measure and to document where you're getting, including on air quality or energy in households, for example. I think the more specific those uh, indicators are, uh, the better it is for uh, people to know where they're going and whether the policies that they're uh, implementing are having an effect. Um, the third thing that I'll mention is costs and benefits. As you probably know, the costs of, for healthcare in societies around the world are increasing very much. It's becoming a very heavy burden. 17% of the GDP equivalent of the US is spent in healthcare. So that's a lot of money. Uh, and developing countries are facing the same kinds of very expensive diseases and very expensive treatments. Now, what we can do with looking at the terms and the cause of your health and the ways of preventing is actually to see how much we can avoid. And things that we are doing is, what's the cost of inaction? If you're not taking action today to do this prevention through uh, access to good spaces, for example, how much are you paying, or you will pay, a society will pay in the future? So those are the kinds of things that we have a, a, an easy example, we have an easier one. We have some software that does cost-benefit analysis for uh, improvements in cycling infrastructure in a city. And you can use it, it's in our website, you can put your own data and you get your results. And in general, is orders of magnitude larger the benefits for public health. And that's only considering the physical activity benefits, which is a large health risk. We're sophisticating a bit, putting improvements in air pollution and, and other things. So I think those, that, that kind of tools that we can have, not only the health systems, but also people in civil society, in municipalities to use to make the health arguments uh, meaningful and see how is it that helps their own planning. I think that's the space where we feel comfortable with and where we uh, see we can engage with, with cities. Thank you, Carlos. Um, Thomas, if you don't mind, I'd like to skip you and uh, pass, on to, <laughs> pass it on to Dr. Smith. But uh, thank you. I, I, I heard you talk about you know, the health benefits of open spaces. I, I, I doubt anybody argues with that. But more specifically to WHO is the issue of guidelines. And I, I believe at that point, the agencies, the other UN agencies, might want to meet with you there so that our architects don't just run away and build what they want to build, but that indeed they have a specific dimension and health guidelines to it. Thank you so much. Dr. Smith, please. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, UNICRI is mandated to assist intergovernmental, governmental, and non-governmental organizations in formulating and implementing improved policies in the field of crime prevention and criminal justice. Thus, if you think about that, safe is the part that UNICRI plays because we spend our time looking at crime prevention and crime intervention. The Institute has been working exclusively or extensively, sorry, in areas of security governance, enhancing collaboration among the various stakeholders in the security-related fields, such as vulnerable targets, major event security, de-radicalization of violent extremist offenders, and others. In particular, the security governance approach adopted by UNICRI has always promoted a strong civil society engagement as well as enhanced partnership between the private and public sector. In line with this approach and the expertise acquired through these various niches, 
of Unicree's activities, in 2013, the Institute launched its initiative in the field of urban security and the objective to address the security challenges posed by the current urbanization trends. In particular, we believe that two elements are necessary to promote crime prevention and security urban settings. The harmonization of existing expertise on specialized topics applicable to the urban context and civil society inclusion and local ownership. And if you'll excuse me for having to read some of this because I am new and my staff doesn't allow me to talk without notes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for giving us a succinct overview of the um, intervention public space can make in protecting vulnerable groups and especially you mentioned de-radicalization. De that I think it's a trending concern. I left you for last, Thomas, because I know that being a planner and an, an architect, um, that you pull all these threads together and make it relevant for where we live today. How does open space pull all these things together and how do you engage in your daily mandate as you inhabit it with open space? Well, I think I started to, uh, to talk about these issues a little yesterday, but the, the fact that UN Habitat is, our mandate is the development of sustainable cities. And the definition of, of, of a city as such, from my perspective, would be multi-sectorial. There are so many different things that has to work at the same time to actually have a good city. And all those aspects, be it safety, be it mobility, be it density, be it quality of life, be it financial um, resources for the local authority, they all are connected to the public space. And UN Habitat works intensively with public space as a backbone. Uh, the whole basic system of the city is the public. It's, when you think of a city, you think of the public part. It's not the private. And we collect best practices, we put together different kind of toolboxes in order to assist local authorities around the world uh, to create a system for their cities in order to function for everyone in the city. And um, this issue of inclusiveness is, is fundamental and public space is basically the living room for big parts of the society that have no other opportunities. So public space becomes uh, very important when you have a human rights approach uh, to uh, de sustainable development. I think that the conference that we are actually sitting in here, we, which is partly organized by, by UN Habitat and the, in, the response that it has given, it actually also shows how uh, important this issue has become in, in the general debate. So, let me just say that we think that there is not one single aspect of a city which is not in one or another way connected to the public space. Thank you. If I understood you well, the, the, you've hammered on the next, uh, we've invited the next question, which is challenges. The challenge of putting all these multiplicities and multidimensional aspects together, uh, not to suggest to you what your next answer should be. But if I can start from you, ma'am, what do you perceive as the challenge of uniquely in using public space? Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> a functional and proper, uh, prosperous use of public spaces in cities requires a multi-sectoral approach with multi-stakeholders. And as a matter of fact, an, an efficient and accurate city management requires that special attention is devoted to a wide range of different issues pertaining to the urban context. The UN family holds the unique advantage, I believe, of being composed by special entities that deal with the different aspects linked to urban management, the environmental sustainability, the crisis response, the crime, prevention as well as intervention. 
and enhanced cooperation among different UN agencies allows the development of a comprehensive and strategic approach towards the establishment of functional cities. I believe that coordination and integration process launched by the UN Habitat within the framework of Habitat 3 is pursuing this long-term objective, the new urban agenda, and will result in a collective effort and diverse expertise. In this regard, Unicree supports the approach adopted by Habitat 3, and in line with this perspective is strengthening cooperation with numerous UN entities in the framework of its urban security program. And later this afternoon, I'll talk a little bit about one of our projects. Thank you very much. In about a minute, Thomas, what are the challenges? Well, there are so many challenges, but one could also say that this is a power struggle because the public uh -huh. space is used by different groups and it becomes kind of a dialogue between pedestrians and cars or between those that are using the public space for income generating activities and those that use it for leisure and so forth. So there is a need for uh, structured negotiations, which is in some countries functioning very well and in some it is not as, uh, as successful. There is the challenge of privatization of public space. So we are actually seeing many, many examples on how public space slowly disappears into uh, different kind of private, private uh, areas. This can go uh, by land grabbing or it can go by legislation, but it is really a, a challenge as such. We have a lack of understanding for who should maintain the public space. So it's, it's all kind of committed uh, groups that are in discussion very often with local authorities on, on how should this be, be, be solved, sorted out from, from that perspective. And I think that we have also quite a number of, of development um, projects where the uh, public space is not included in the original planning because of lack of direct financial return. Thank you. What would be WHO's most biting challenge in managing public space, using it for amelioration of urban public health? I think I'll talk about the, the range of risks to health which are in the public, uh, in the public space. And the, the major one, I think, is air pollution. Uh, there are seven million deaths a year estimated to be due to air pollution. That's as much as tobacco smoke. We do a lot to reduce tobacco smoke. We haven't done nearly enough to reduce air pollution. Uh, so I think within the range of risks, and I'll put it on the framework of risks to health in public space, to get a good public space and to have a healthy public space, you have to address those. Primarily air pollution, but also noise, uh, in traffic injuries, in other kinds of uh, interpersonal violence. Um, uh, space that where children can play safely because that's important for their development. So I think that the addressing that range of risks in the public space is part of, and we see as a challenge. Uh, we would like public space, we also like public space uh, that is conducive to health, that is protective to health, uh, and we would like it where people can access, access it, especially people who have special risks to health, such as the poor, those that's living in uh, slums or uh, in where we have difficulties to uh, accessing the, the public space in any way, um, like the disabled or so. So there's this range of managing risks around the public space. Uh, another type of challenge is your nine square meters or our nine square meters uh, of public space or a green space per, per person in the, in, the, in the population which still is, is draw only from an expert review, a very old expert review. We haven't had enough science around it. And I quite, you know, I would love to have some more uh, science to be brought into uh, qualifying what the urban space and quantifying how much public space is needed. Uh, we are, at the moment, we're unable to include that in the uh, housing and health guidelines because of the, the still um, sort of limited scientific work on that. But I think that's one area that we would like to see addressed. It wouldn't be perhaps too difficult to, 
to, to visit. So two kinds of challenges, the risks to health in the public space they have to, and how they can be best managed, and then some more of the specific evidence around the benefits from public space. If, if we know the benefits, then we can recommend and we can sort of quantify and can document the impacts on health and the benefits on health, and that's very helpful in uh, increasing the understanding and sharing the understanding of what does it mean and where are we going kind of thing. So uh, those two. Did I hear you right that nine square meters per person is the required minimum? Yeah? Um, that's being said a number of years ago by an expert panel in WHO, I think it's in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wouldn't say anything like that as a statement today in WHO. We're required to pre present systematic reviews of the literature and show uh, you know, how much and what, how different it is from 12 square meters or from yeah. five square meters. So um, I think there the evidence is still too patchy for us to come uh, clear. And I'd love, for, I'd love for us to really come clear on that because I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. I just threw you a lifeline there and you missed it. You are sitting next to an architect asking for more space. <laughs> yes, please, um, Stefanos. Uh, what are the environmental challenges? Thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, allow me just an intervention for the nine square meters, um, which I do believe Dr. Carlos said that it's a figure we should probably not using. And I think, I think we should be very ambitious, and um, if we look a little bit at uh, what are the cases in cities, we will see that nine square meters maybe uh, was 30 years ago a kind of absolute minimum. We still have cities that they are well below the nine square meters, even in the Roscon, one square meter, but we have cities like Vienna, for example, which is in the 120 square meters per person. So uh, I think we need to look with ambition on the minimum required public space. The, the challenge when you talk about challenges as the last in the panel is that all the big challenges have been said by the previous speakers, but I would focus on one thing that I will call uh, short termism, is the issue that when we do plan, either as institutional stakeholders or as our private stakeholders, we take a very short term approach on the planning and on evaluating the benefits, the risks, and the costs. And usually, environmental sustainability and the environmental uh, benefits will be much more profound in a long-term basis. It's not only the health, because a decision we will take to today about public space will affect the health of the people after 20, 30, or 40 years. But it's also the decisions we, we take on how much green space we do allocate in the cities that it will affect the future of the cities in the next 40 or 50 years. Unfortunately, the metrics that we use when it comes down to the cost-benefit analysis or to analysis of investments, return of investments, net present value, they will go to four to five years. And this amount of time is incapable of capturing the complexity of the benefits that um, the public space will bring to the environment and to the people. And this big challenge is complemented by, I think, by the absence of data, the absence of standards, and the absence of, of some internationally uh, and scientifically, I would say, approved metrics on the benefits of green spaces and on the benefits of, of public spaces. We do have a lot of cases. I would say that, unfortunately, these cases are coming mostly from developed countries, and we need to create the environmental, social, and business case for public space in developing cities, because these are the ones that they will define the future. And let me finish by saying that, with the recent study we have done in UNEP, we estimated that 60% of the infrastructure that will be needed to support the future of cities in the developing countries is yet to be built. 60%, almost two-thirds of the infrastructure that we will need in the next 30 years should be built. If this infrastructure is built with the cost-benefit analysis that they set up in a payoff period of five or six years, I don't think we will take the right decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Stefanos. I think talking the way you are today, you may lose all your political friends in the room. 
because they only have so much a term in office. And so if you're saying sh short termism, you call it? Yeah. So, yes, I yeah. know it's not very popular. It's, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a term coincided by UNEP and a company called Sustainability about four years ago, yeah. and we call it short termism. Yes, and it's a way of thinking which we would like to get rid of because it's the business as usual, and I think we want to go business unusual if we want to make an impact on sustainable development. The politicians come into office for a term of four, five years, and they want to see results. They want to deliver because they want to get votes the next time around. So probably we have to think of some advice. How do we therefore, Minister of Environment, you can't come into office and you tell me, Minister, you, can't, you, you, you invest this much in this, but you can't see it until your grandchildren will see the results. Then I, I, I would not be feel, feeling encouraged. You know, we, these are the realities we face with our political office holders. They want quick results. They want visible, tangible results to deliver to their people. These are some of the challenges we can take home as we think about them today. Last uh, question I'd like us to quickly take a round in. OK, we are here as UN agencies. And believe me, it's a heavy responsibility for four agencies to represent what? 50 others. What must we do different? to realign the way we work so that public spaces are not painted green today, tomorrow blue, tomorrow yellow, when the WHO comes, Habitat comes, and they say, no, 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 none of this works, and we want to reshape them. It, our, our beneficiaries are one. How can we today, at least the four of us here, reunite our language, realign our concerns, so that we deliver this holistic public space that is all the things that Ambassador Inga had lifted out before us as cohesive, safe, sustainable, pleasant, you know, inclusive, and the rest of them. Please, how can we, beginning again with you, sir. Thank you very much. I think, uh, I would say that there are three dimensions of that they could define future action of a joint UN approach uh, for uh, better uh, public spaces. The one is, I, I think we need each of, it's one of us in the UN family to find the specific niche that we will contribute our knowledge, our information, and our strengths. And I think it's very important when we do talk about the niche to forget about our labels and brand names and focus on the substance and on the needs. And here, allow me one more time uh, to talk about the needs of developing countries and the cities on, in developing countries. So I think that. Um, it should not be a discussion about if it's a green economy, if it's a blue economy, um, if it's um, uh, a campaign, um, if, it's, if it's something that comes under a label, but it should be a discussion that it will address the basic needs of developing countries, and these are how I'm going to provide to my citizens the physical and institutional environment that they will thrive and they will improve their well-being. The second is that, um, the, the second dimension is it, it comes to measurement. I do think that there's a profound need and there's a huge demand and I'm listening this thing every time I talk to state and non-state stakeholders for standardized metrics, for more information, for a better capacity of the cities to measure uh, their performance regarding sustainable development. I am very optimistic because I think that one of the challenges on achieving things in the UN system was that everyone, different agency, was coming with, an, with a different measurement framework. Now, we do have, and, and hopefully we will have in September 2015, an agreed Sustainable Development Goal 11, which is the Urban Sustainable Development Goal. And it comes with seven targets, three means of implementations, and it will come with specific indicators. And I think this set of indicators and the targets that they will define the Sustainable Development Goal 11 should be the common basis, and it's a golden opportunity to be the common basis for all UN to start measuring and supporting uh, the, uh, the cities on achieving sustainability. And last but not least, I think that all this uh, work we will do on collecting data translating this data to information, and then together with science, making this information knowledge should support 
the development of evidence-based policy making, which is what should be the core of the UN system. How we will put the best of our resources, the best of our knowledge, information, and data to support cities on taking the best decisions that they will help their citizens. Thank you. Thank you, um, Stefanos, Dr. Carlos. Any additional ideas on how we should work, work better for sustainable service delivery to our citizens? Sure. sure. Um, I'll tell you about an initiative that we're doing with it's a health initiative, but we're uh, starting it with uh, the partners who are here on the table, except for safety, perhaps we should engage her, but it's with Habitat, with uh, UNAP, with WMO, with other people, which is uh, how can we bring the health evidence or the health evidence of health benefits from public policies, which, you know, on energy, on transportation, on buildings, on, on land use, and, and including on public space, to uh, be usable to local level stakeholders, and that is civil society, there's the local health system. Um, and so it is very cross-sectorial. Uh, on the other hand, I think we're, what we want is to use the opportunities that uh, to get the, the lo localization of health systems, where every village has a health person, a health uh, you know, worker. Um, and the health system is very spread and uh, we have a, a very good coverage. So how can we use that strength, and the other strength is the understanding that we have about what causes your health or not, in the energy, in transport, in buildings, etc. cetera. Uh, how is that we can bring that to be usable to local actors? To inform not what will happen in the world, but if they adopt policies to mitigate climate change in their city, what will mean for their citizens uh, in the future, certainly, but immediately. Some of those benefits can be uh, documented and measured very short term. Injuries, for example, or air pollution reduction. So uh, how can we make that usable so we can combine a long-term view of sustainability with short-term uh, outcomes? Uh, we all need low-hanging to address and to search for low-hanging fruit. We need short-term results. So that's very reasonable that you know, a mayor will have a short you know, lifespan probably in the, in the municipality. So we have to be able to combine a long-term view with the short-term uh, outcomes. And what we're doing in this Urban Health Initiative is actually to produce the knowledge, the tools, and to facilitate the engagement. Because part of the issue, I think, is that people hesitate to engage in some difficult uh, you know, issues like climate change. So I'm a poor country, you know, it's the fault of the rich, why should I bother? And I say, well, what is it that you gain by engaging with climate change mitigation and adaptation now? And that's the question that every village should be looking at. What would my slum or the slum that I'm responsible for be able to gain from adopting certain uh, measures, either to reduce, and I, we're using air pollution very deliberately as an entry point, is an easier entry point than climate change is for many uh, governments uh, to use in certain parts of the world. So we're quite flexible, and uh, the, one of the things that we, I think, links a lot with the way you work is this business of action research. And how is it that small bits of research demonstrating benefits from local policies to local population can help trigger the understanding, the engagement, and to facilitate action at that level. So we're uh, at the operations front because health people are, I'm a doctor, you know, I've been doing public health, I've been seeing patients, or so for me I'm interested in, in seeing the results uh, immediately as well as uh, in the long term. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas, please, how can we work better? Public space is the area in town where, where people interact and they meet, and I think that in this case, it's actually going to be the place where also different UN agencies meet. <laughs> because the, we have the fact that the urbanization has led to uh, new focuses for uh, many of the, the UN agencies, and they have to uh, urbanize part of their work. And UN Habitat as being, uh, with a long history in, in sustainable cities, we have developed very good relations with local authorities, which basically are the implementers 
um, uh, when it comes to, to, to the cities. Even though there is lots of, of decisions taken by central government, they all have to be implemented by local authorities. So we will join together with the, our sister organizations in the UN systems uh, to actually create good quality um, the public space with all these aspects um, where different agencies have, have their mandate. The, the fact uh, that, like Stefano said, that, that we are now going to have the NSDG goal uh, on public space, and that means that the follow-up uh, has to be done by the whole UN agencies from the different aspects. And that is where we are going to develop uh, ways to cooperate on, 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 on the personal approach from the different agencies to public space, but to cities as a whole. Hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, on the issue of collaboration and uh, streamlining as the crime preventive agency and safety specialist, how would you like to see us work differently? Well, as I said earlier, the challenge is working together and we need to change our way of thinking. And I have three things that I think we should change our, our way of thinking. First of all, in, uh, when we think about crime, we think about a local perspective, a member state perspective, and then a regional perspective. And we have to focus on all three of these because crime displacement is a fact of life. So when we clean up one neighborhood, it moves, crime moves to another neighborhood. They move to the neighborhood with the least amount of rule of law. So we need to ensure that we're looking at things from a very broad perspective, but we can't leave out the local perspective. The second thing is the UN, the UN um, agencies need to plan their own obsolescence in this field. And by that, I mean our goal needs to focus on empowering and helping communities, local communities, entire member states, and then of course regions, to be able to handle the issues themselves. In crime, we don't worry about running out of business. We know that we'll have it. So it would be nice to run out of business in public spaces and then move on to the next place. And then finally, a, a very, um, practical piece is funding. The way the UN is funded helps to stovepipe our um, responses to things. And so we need to think about how we can change working within the system that we have, how we can change the way funding is distributed to ensure that all disciplines are involved because this is a multidisciplinary problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Believe me, our panelists have all been very com obe obedient panelists. They have not bombarded us with too many jargons we can't follow. I, I believe they've broken down a complex issue because the UN does have complex issues. To us, to our understanding, thank you for simplifying the issue of public space, your challenges, your definitions of your mandates and how you engage with public space, and what your thoughts are on how best we can work together. And work together is what the governments really, truly would want to see us do more, uh, be it within the framework of the UN Development uh, Administration framework or within the, um, at the high policy level between our UN agencies. The less of the silos, the much better for the sustainability of public spaces. Now I would like to turn to you, our audience, and take some few questions so that we can uh, animate the debate and ask any of our panelists specific questions or just general questions before we come back to them. Yes, I see Dr. Maimuna here. Yes, I see the, our colleague from Uganda. Yes, three. Four at the back there. Sorry, the lights are sometimes five. One, two, three, you know your roles now. One, two, three, four, five, and? Is there one here, six? Is there a six? No, five, enough, okay. <laughs> okay, quickly, please, because our time is limited. Um, yes, please. Thanks, uh, Maria. Uh, I have two uh, observations. One is something that is very, I feel very contented 
The other one, uh, I'm a bit something worrying me, and I need your your uh, the four panelists uh, uh, um, to help me. Well, the first one that is uh, make myself happy is that uh, in my city we started the cleaner, greener, safer, and healthier Sebrang Pride. And now with all four of you, that I think I am in the right track since talking about cleaner, greener, safer, and healthier Sebrang Pride, which also include your public spaces contributed to the cleaner, greener, safer, and healthier, even though uh, uh, we are looking into a very broad perspective. Uh, I'm very happy with that, uh, Mariam. And a second one is about the environmental uh, uh, crime, crime and environmental. Uh, we started the crime prevention uh, through environmental design for our new, uh, for our new development. So all those professionals, like architect, planners, engineers, when they first draw the first line on the plan that you would like to submit to my city, they must be following our crime prevention through environmental design guidelines. Uh, that is, I think, I am in the right track. But the third one that is worrying me is about the public spaces definition, where we discussed yesterday and today we still are talking about it, which include the places where the people can use and also include street. So uh, at the moment, uh, I have the guidelines for 30% of the new development, the, any developers must put aside open spaces, green spaces. And if the definition or the guideline that you're going to formulate it, uh, 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 in later on or by UN, which also include street, I'm afraid that the new development, they said, yes, look, I'm already submitted the 30% public spaces, which include 10% open spaces, 15% infrastructure and street, 5% uh, mall. I don't know whether we will be going towards the uh, uh, what that we really need in terms of having the cleaner, greener, safer, and healthier as Bram Pride at the end of the day when the new development include all these components in the definition of public spaces versus uh, open spaces. Uh, that's what's, uh, something that I would like to find out uh, uh, from the uh, four panelists, how to tackle this uh, dilemma. Thank you very much. Thank you. Definition of public space. Thomas, I think you will take that. What is actually the percentage we are talking about? Yes, sir. I'm Mehdi Rutuama from Uganda. I work with Slum Dwellers International. So I have three um, key issues that I wanted to understand. One is the we've been citing a lot of minimal awareness about this issue of public space, especially for the developing countries. And my observation has been that even in this conference where a lot of information has been shared, very few of these governments are here to know about this. And I think this is the role of the UN moving forward. What kind of strategies do you have to ensure that clear roadmap on sensitization about this concept. And, and then the second one is on the, what the UN needs to do differently. In my own country, we've had a situation where so many UN agencies do not coordinate. They, each one comes with a different project. They do different projects, no coordination, no, no one listens from the other. And then these cities get excited. So I think when it comes to public space, we, we want to see a more coordinated, integrated approach towards uh, in these towns. And then lastly, um, we, we think that the pressure on politicians for short-term delivery always comes from um, not involving the people in planning. So. In Uganda, we've started uh, working with other organizations on city development strategies, which is a more long-term kind of thinking for our cities. Of course, the towns will have their short-term plans, one-year development plan, three, four, five years development plans, but involving the citizens in long-term planning, I think is quite key, and it will reduce the pressure on politicians. So those are some of the things. Thank I you. Your comments are well noted. Third one, please. I think it's here somewhere. Yes, lady there. Kindly keep your questions or comments short. I'm Sri Devi from Hyderabad. I'm a landscape architect. Uh, my uh, question was about uh, what uh, the UN, uh, do you 
uh, take cognizance of existing solutions in the sense that public spaces which are, which are not uh, defined as public spaces uh, in town planning convention, but which are popular with local uh, uh, people. Uh, for example, in India, in many, uh, many of our towns and cities, we have places where 200 uh, people per day go there, but which is not uh, you know, recognized as a public space as per town planning convention. And also in terms of medical uh, uh, you know, health issues, uh, there are existing traditional uh, uh, you know, uh, aspects of uh, treating people in our towns and cities and villages. And these are based upon local flora and um, maybe in some uh, places on fauna as well, certain parts of animals or whatever. And uh, also there, is, there are festivals and which celebrate these aspects where these uh, particular groves are uh, sacred. They become sacred because of the healing properties and they're preserved. And there are festivals and kinds of recreational activities, recreation which is perceived as rec recreation by local people, but not as per town planning conventions. So is there an aspect of this, uh, of the four panelists and what they uh, connected with, which also looks at what is existing, the knowledge which has been, somebody presented uh, yesterday, I think, uh, about 10,000 years of urban planning and so on. And public open space is not restricted to urban areas alone. It's also for our villages. And I wanted to know your, uh, uh, you know, what what uh, what kind of considerations you all look at because even where 200 uh, people converge, Kumbh Mela, for example, in India, the largest gathering of people, there are no uh, there are no safety issues, there are no health issues, uh, there are lots of uh, local uh, medical, uh, you know, uh, solutions to any kind of small. Uh, medical issues which crop up because of so many people coming together to celebrate uh, what is a landscape, uh, uh, you know, convergence of rivers or whatever that is. And the sacred part is a tiny minimal part of that. It is more about the fairs, the getting together, perception of recreation. They celebrate and they go back. None of those people go to tennis courts or go to a gazebo to sit in a park or what Mumford called municipal sterility of our parks and gardens because of town planning conventions. And I thought I would uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, want to know whether this uh, Congress would, uh, you know, give a stricture to town planning convention, which has imposed all these problems on our cities and all of us. Uh, okay, point well okay. made. I think our number four is over. There. Yes, sir. Thank you. Is it working? Yes. Uh, Yodan Rofei, Ben Gurion University, Israel. Uh, I want to build on comments of the first uh, commenters and the last, the last one. Uh, regarding uh, the, minim the numbers, the nine square meters per person, the 120 square meters per person, or whatever numbers you want to throw out, and the confusion between public space, open space, green space. Public space is mostly streets. This is, I think, one of the messages we want to bring from this conference, is mostly streets. 20 to 30 percent of the space of cities is streets, will ever be streets. And often we want to move people to public open spaces, green spaces, to get them away from, street, from streets instead of actually making the streets livable for people and the squares livable for people. So I think there's a great danger in those numbers because if we want compact, compact walkable, livable cities, they have to be close and dense. And these numbers, by providing particular amount of public space, usually little used, often neglected and non-maintained, are actually hurting more than helping. Wonderful addition and clarification. That's an opinion well taken. Um, number five and the last one. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, lectures. Uh, I'm coming from Japan and I'm studying about the housing planning, housing policy and community planning. So I just only uh, focus on the relationship uh, aging and uh, public space. Uh, I think aging is a problem not only for the industrial country, but also nowadays becomes the developing country, I believe that. And from the uh, experience of our society, I know that uh, elderly become 
nowadays victim of the crime and natural disaster and also they suffered from the environmental barriers. And on the other hand, I know the person uh, who is the director of WHO Kobe Center named Alex Ross. Uh, he promoted age-friendly city uh, project. And also he thought uh, this project is quite suitable for our societies. So that's why I would like to you know, ask about what kind of impact could public space provide uh, these situations, I mean the aged societies, especially in the case of our society faced to the super aged situations. And could you show me some advice and suggestions to us Japanese? Thank you. I believe not only the Japanese, but uh, everywhere we have aging communities would be interested in that answer. Thank you for that question. One more. Yes. So we heard from uh, several of the previous uh, people that streets of public spaces are a primary part of our system. They're also, according to the World Health Organization, the location of over a million fatalities a year. And so those, that is a major health, safety, and environmental issue. So what I would like to know is what the UN agencies can do about changing the basic design vehicle for our streets from single occupancy vehicles to moving people in safer and healthier ways. Hmm. Short and precise, thank you so much. Dear colleagues, you have heard the various comments, issues and questions raised. In a minute each, please, no longer could you. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> You've got the magic wand. You are the UN, right? Anyway, no, seriously, just pick any that you feel uh, able that speaks to your issues and you respond. Kindly, please. If I may start with uh, Dr. Smith. Thank you. I can solve the problems of the world in one minute or less. <laughs> um, I think that thinking about the UN focusing on its own planned obsolescence, um, some of the comments directed at short-term delivery and um, uh, what we can do to help communities and then the, you know, ultimately the member states and the regions. If we continue to focus on planned obsolescence, we have to think about how our funding comes in because the member states determine our funding. So, for example, in my organization, we are 100% voluntary contributions. So a member state comes to us and says, we would like to help someone do X, Y, or Z. And then we go out and we help someone do that. Um, and sometimes they're more focused on what they want done than other times. And if we think about um, helping as we're doing our work, focusing on the long term, um, during our short term of funding, because funding usually ranges one to two years, sometimes three years, and then the funding is gone. So our intervention has to be quick, impactful, and focused on the long term, because in the short term, um, that's when we have our funding, and then we move on to the next crisis and solve the next problem. Um, we also have to think about localizing our programs. And I think this goes to the aging problem, it goes to the um, uh, where people really gather uh, problems. We need to do a better job of researching and assessing our um, situations in the, pro in the country or the locality that we're working in so that we don't do a cookie cutter one size fits all. The problem with that is that it takes time to learn about the local um, needs, the very specific local needs, and we often don't have that built into our programs. So we need to change our behavior as well. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to, um, to comment a little on the, on the fact that the measure, the percentages or the square meters, it, I agree, it's really dangerous to, to put up a figure uh, because this, of course, is, is dependent a little of where you are and the local climate and the local culture. And, and if you suddenly say that it has to be 45%, uh, that 
is then going to have the, the debate to focus on this. I think that public space is something that changes over time. You have spaces which are public certain times of the year for, for different kind of, of culture, festivals and so forth, and other parts of the year they are, they are not public. And you would have day and night activities that, that changes the use uh, of, of, of spaces. So here we, we shouldn't really go back to specific figure, but we should get the world to understand that the need is not something that is fairly small that we add on to the rest. The need is fairly much bigger. We are close to actually talking about half of what we have as assets should be public and, and, and the other half uh, private as such. Uh, and I think that when we talk about the aging uh, popula population, other type of vulnerable groups, here we have a, a possibility to actually realize that efforts to create quality public space, not just leave area, but to have quality public space will save such a lot of efforts that would have to be done in other areas. And this is how we are also are going to improve our work together in different UN agencies, because we will suddenly really realize that health and town planning has a lot of things to do with each other, and crime and town planning and implementation of, of these plans are so important. So finally, we have come up to a situation where we realize that, ah, we are working with the same thing, even though we are in different agencies. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll start with the, the last question, uh, single vehicles versus public transport. I think it's very helpful. Uh, we call healthy transport uh, public transport plus cycling and walking, safe cycling and walking. That's our definition in WHO. That's healthy for us. Uh, and that's why we see the evidence for being good for health, which is a mixture of cycling and walking, which is safe, and plus, plus public transport. We're very happy that the SDGs as they stand, there is an indicator for that in, for the cities. And I think we, we, we very much support that. We think that's a very important determinant of health, not only for injuries, but also for noise, for air pollution and other risks. So we, we certainly agree with that point. The aging, uh, age-friendly cities, yes, there's 220 of them, and we think they should be integrated with other aspects of healthy cities and sustainable cities, and I think aging is uh, definitely a, a, a part of that, um, as uh, you know, the needs of other kinds of users or dwellers of the city uh, have also to be considered. So I think it's part and parcel. And you know, I don't think there's ever the intention to do a separate from the, the rest of the, the city interventions. It's just to have a focus on aging and to have an understanding of what aging means in terms of the needs for a city to cater for its elderly citizens. And all the world is aging, so it's, it's uh, a very important issue. Uh, about sacred spaces, traditional medicine festivals, uh, I would call it spiritual health, and in fact, in health impact assessment. And it is more important in certain places than others. Uh, so I think in health impact assessment, there's some people, the Thais especially, who incorporate spiritual health as part of their health impact. Uh, I think that's very cultural specific, specific, but there is experience on that. And I do think that's a very important of you know, identity, a sense of coherence, and you know, it, it plays an important role for some people, for many people, I'd say, not necessarily for everybody. But I think it's important that when we do assess uh, public spaces or sort of the health determinants, et cetera, that's uh, also considered as a determinant, I, I would complete. And we have uh, specific parts of WHO who do sort of traditional medicines and, and, and who work with those, with those issues as well. Um, uh, coordination at local level, it's, it's just right. like, uh, Let's summarize. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the issues in a municipality or in a government, different departments, you know, it's, it's natural that, you know, coordination takes yeah. extra work. So I wouldn't feel. Uh, and the last point is yes, we need more effort on the numbers. And I would certainly agree that we, as long as we can have some of the, what benefits do you have for different numbers, then you will get in the equation right. And I think we should put effort there. Thank you, thank you. You have the last say, Stefan. Thank you. Um, 
I, I'll start with the numbers and the definition. I, I think that the moment that we are listening the, the term public space, each one of us will have something different in mind uh, in relation to where it's coming from. I mean, I have to be very honest with you. When, I, when I'm listening public space, I'm thinking about parks. Uh, but of course, it's not only parks, the public space. It's also the streets. It's also common areas. But the thing that each one of us, depending on its constituency, will come up with another definition, I think it's already a challenge. And this is something that we need seriously to see. And then I would agree that um, the absolute number is not so much what we need to focus, but a very clear, crystal clear definition and some agreement on standards would be, uh, would be something needed. And here is uh, what I see that the UN could become a little bit more coordinated and better. When it comes to local coordination, sir, I would like to say something which I know that um, it's, it might sound bizarre, but it's the truth. The UN actually belongs to the countries. So I do believe that when it comes to the local coordination, uh, which is extremely more difficult as the national coordination, it will need also a very strong demand and mandate from the countries to all UN agencies to, to work together at the local level. A lot of agencies, they do not have a mandate to work at the lo local level. They have only mandates to work at the national level. But I think it's the countries that they should start demanding uh, this thing. And last but not least, on um, there's a specific... Uh, the specific way uh, that uh, citizens are pressuring the governments, and it's called voting. But sometimes it's not enough because it's exercised only in periods of time, every three, four, um, sometimes uh, more often, um, years. But I think the best way of citizens to put pressure is to start demanding solutions that they will improve their daily life and connect these solutions to their um, specific relation with the city's authorities. Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. Shall we give our panelists a round of applause, please? For a job well done, for a job well done.